Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Late Night Villa Filler. I'm here as always, my good friend Dan Wiseman. Dan, Aston Villa nil, Everton nil. How you doing, mate? Not bad, mate. How are you? Not so bad myself, man. Not so bad myself. Obviously, it's Late Night Villa Filler, as you guys well, as you guys will be able to see. It, you, you can't tell that from home. Uh, <laughs> it's about a quarter past ten. Uh, I have just got back from the game, uh, fortunate enough to have press access for this one. And um, again, I thought we're back in this position with the channel where Villa don't really have these great results and there's probably not going to be many of you guys watching. So to you guys, first of all, that are with us right now, just give you guys a massive shout out, sticking with us. Uh, we're near the end of the season and this season for the channel, Dan, it's been mental, hasn't it? I can't believe we're, we're here. We've, we've, cons- we've had a podcast out every single game pretty much straight away, if not the day after at the absolute latest. We've done previews for half of the games this season. Uh, we've been really consistent, so we'd just like to thank for your support again. Uh, just mm-hmm. before we get into into this in this podcast, Dan, because you know, without these guys, uh, you know, we'd we'd be nothing. We really would. So, massive shout out to you guys. And again, you know, this probably isn't going to be the most enjoyable podcast, uh, mainly because <laughs> we all know you guys enjoy it when Villa win. But here we are. It was a draw, Dan, and I feel like I'm actually in a minority here, where I felt like this game was almost like. The perfect continuation on from our game against Everton only 12 days ago. I thought it was a real end to end game. And, you know, kind of reading, reading Twitter as and when I could, um, a lot of people kind of thought it was a bit of a snooze fest. But I, I don't, again, I don't know whether that's just because I was at the game, Dan. Uh, I did think, you know, kind of looking at it from a neutral perspective that, um, you know, there was, there was plenty for people to be watching and enjoying as the kind of uh, drama was all unfolding at Old Trafford with what's gone on tonight uh, there with the Liverpool game. Yeah, well, that's all Sky touched on, to be honest with you. It was like um, everything was going on there. So for like um, the peasants among us that have to watch this game on television, would you believe? Um, Who does that? It's like, yeah. <laughs> no, it was, it was like there was plenty of good football on show, I thought. Like a lot of very technically, Everton have some, like, some players that I really enjoy watching. Um, that you know, so many like so a few months that Alan pulled out that I was like really impressed. Like, there's like a lot of good football on this play, two very well coached sides, two sides with very lofty aspirations. Um, and the only problem was, I just don't think there was too much by means of chances. So, I, I mean, you know, I, I watched it and it was very easy to digest. You know, I never really felt too nervous as a Villa fan, Everton or a side who, who are fantastic away from home, fantastic. You know, they've only lost three times in their 18 away games that they've played this season, which is a crazy record. Um, and so I, th- I thought we handled that pre- th- pretty well. It's just, you know, and, and this is a thing for both teams is that, that, you know, in terms of actual clear-cut chances, I mean, you look at that one that the Martinez save from the Calvert-Lewin header, which is, was a brilliant save from Emmy. Um, a, a few more other than that, but not not too many, unfortunately. And I, and I think that's why... You know, it won't be one for the neutral, I don't think. No, it, it's one as well where I think, you know, looking at the two sides, Everton need to win their remaining games to kind of get into Europe. As for Villa, it's just kind of breeding that habit of winning, getting back into winning games, trying to win games without Jack Grealish. Obviously, the skipper came on late on for 20 minutes. But I felt it, as we just kind of spoke about our fair, Danny, I feel like we're almost just ready for the season's end. Um, both for the just the sake of the content on the channel uh, and also just I think these guys need a break it's been an incredibly long season Dan COVID obviously hit in January I hate to keep bringing that up but I feel like that you know that is a legitimate reason as to why Aston Villa have kind of fallen off of, off the face uh, in 2021 at least I think um, and Everton are a very effective side and what really caught my eye today was how Flexible they were in kind of changing formation in game to, to kind of adapt to certain scenarios. They lined up as a 4 4 2. When they were defending, that was a 5 3 2. When they were attacking, it was a 4 3 3. That kind of fluidity uh, really saw them, you know, they, they were breaking on the counter attack uh, and they looked very convincing going forward. They were quick moving through the thirds, um, which was, you know, obviously not very good from a Villa perspective. But in terms of watching, it had all the hallmarks of, uh, you know, a vintage Carlo Ancelotti team. Uh, you know, 15 attempts um, from Everton, 10 of which from open play. I'm going to actually sprinkle in the XG now, Dan, before I forget, because I forgot to mention the overall XG on the last podcast. Can't we have it? Um, Aston Villa with an XG of 0.68 uh, compared to Everton's 1.19. Uh, 
uh, you know, and that, that first of all demonstrates how miraculous Emi Martinez was in between the sticks again. Some inspiring saves, as you alluded to earlier, Dan. He's now equaled Brad Friedel's clean sheet record at the club, which is, of course, a record that encompasses defenders too, as Esri Kansa so proudly tweeted. We can't forget the defenders are also responsible for some of the clean sheets. Um, but, I mean, what a feat that is, Dan. 15 clean sheets, three games left to go. Can he actually go and break the record now? He's equaled it. Do we think Emmy's capable of breaking it? Yeah, I, I think Emmy is... Uh, I'm really happy for him, and that's probably, you know, the main talking point from this podcast, isn't it? Because it feels like he's been within touching distance of that uh, clean sheet record for some time now. But it's been, you know, seven or eight games now since we last kept a clean sheet. And, you know, just on a personal note, I'm I'm really happy for him. And that back line, is, as you rightly mentioned, mate, to, to finally get over that line, because... It has been a long time in the making, you know, it felt like in the first half of the season, we had this really impenetrable defence and it's become a bit leaky, actually, in the second half of the season, if anything, you know, the, a fair few sides have now picked holes in it. And so to shout out a side like Everton, who, as I say, do perform so well away from home, I mean, was was really good. And that 15th clean sheet is, is very sizable. And I mean, you know, you can't help but continue to reference the improvement on last season, you know, just as not just in the goals created, but in so many other, the shots faced in so many other different metrics, the way that we've improved defensively is, is so noteworthy. And I think that's, there's always a silver line into every game. We like to think here on the Villa Villa podcast and, and that one's a little bit more obvious, isn't it? Absolutely. I do think as well, just kind of generally all round, I think there were some good performances. Tyrone Mings made some very crucial blocks and interceptions during this game. Very good. John McGinn, as you know, as you tweeted from the account, Dan, and as I tweeted earlier as well, it really felt like we were seeing John McGinn back at his best. Uh, and, you know, in, in Dean Smith's press conference, uh, can, can we say he's friend of the pod? I've asked them a few questions in the presses. Can we say that? You guys I think so. Let's do it. We've got Dean Smith, friend of the podcast. Uh, you know, he was he was very keen to, to heap praise on McGinn. Uh, and, you know, he he was very insistent that everybody at the club kind of knows his qualities. I hope the question, I mean, I asked about McGinn's, I referenced sort of poor performances in recent months. I hope it didn't come across the wrong way um, as a dig, but he was very clear uh, in reiterating how much, you know, how highly he's rated at the club uh, and how he's just kind of really been struggling in recent months to find the consistency. So, Hopefully, as we kind of see at the end of this season, we see a bit more of that from John. Uh, and another one, I mean, Dan, I'm actually going to take this completely away from the game. And, and it's kind of just a frustration overall, just kind of off the pitch as we're kind of trying to see at the end of the season, Dan, is this is perfect time. Uh, this is the time we were really expecting to kind of see Morgan Sanson embed into the side. It's been very unfortunate he's been out with his knee injury. I think he was back in training this week. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, or people in the comments down below. Um, He's one that I think would have really benefited from this final season. Uh, you know, this kind of final stretch. I think preseason is going to be a bit weird with COVID. You know, we had a Welsh preseason camp last time. Obviously, the season beforehand, we went to Minnesota and we had a very awesome trip there. So, preseason is going to be a bit different for all of the players. So, hopefully, that will be enough time for you know the likes of Sanson, even you know, to reference the, the three youngsters who were on the bench day: Triple Maker, Philogene Bades, and of course Ramsey came on. Preseason is going to be massive for these kind of players, Dan, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think we, you kind of forget about Sanson sometimes, don't you? And, and you know, that's not, it's just because you sort of, how new he is, how little he's sort of played in terms of starts and, and things like that. And that's a real, there's been a few games actually where I felt like he's going to be a really positive influence once he's back in the side and firing on all cylinders. He's going to feel like a new signing. You know, once he eventually gets in better last season, such as, you know, the, the little extent that we've seen him play. And I think there's, especially in games like today, where there is more space in the midfield, where the midfield is operating at a fuller capacity, I think it's gone from being one of our real weaknesses just a sort of month or so ago. But the midfield has really tightened up in recent games. And I think, you know, McGinn's at the fore of that. I thought Douglas really made amends. Not that he particularly needed to for the penalty against Man United, but just on a personal level for him, he would have wanted to go out there today and put in a good performance. And I feel like he did that well. And, you know, if you sort of just added Sanson to the mix, that as that that ball carrier, that sort of player that's perhaps a more 
can operate a little bit higher up, perhaps has got a, a one or two more penetrative passes in behind. He's perhaps a little bit more technical than the likes of, of McGinn. And I feel like that's a really nice balance that you can start to create in that midfield. I did think we were going to see Nakamba today. That's something I touched on in my preview. I thought that, um, you know, one or two guys in that midfield probably deserved a rest, but we've gone with it. And when you consider how well Nakamba's done this season, how well... Sanson looks like he can bend into that midfield. And then you've got the young lads coming through that you touched on. I mean, Carney can't be too far away from the first team. You know, he's going to be... There's so many teams that are offering him a spot. So many teams interested in that, the services. And, and Villain need to be careful how they play their cards because he's going to feel like he's ready. I mean, you know, when you're scoring the amount of goals that he is and the amount of the goal contributions and his numbers in the youth league are, are just crazy you can only do that for so long without starting to feel like, right, I'm ready for the next step. And you know, when you're playing under 23s, the next step's the first team. And, and he's on the bench and he's starting to become, you know, a regular face around the first team dressing room, I hope. And so um, you'd like to think that we'd get in before the end of the season, but the midfield's playing really well. And, and so um, it's just nice to have so many wealth of options and different ways that you can structure that. Absolutely. And Dan, of course, we have to mention it. Keenan Van Nistelrooy starting the game who scored rating of 6.7 uh i feel like he really struggled today and you know the kid the, the we're the kid of fan club obviously but the the, the anti keenan agenda will say ah oh, well you know he didn't make he didn't make a mark he didn't do this he didn't do that uh i mean he, I mean, it's, he has a 68 percent pass success rate and you know something again that dean did kind of touch on in his press conference after the game is is watkins is the kind of forward who's going to really you know go beyond press, uh, get, get in behind defences really and look to exploit that, which, you know, again, we saw that perfectly against Everton last time. He creates that chance himself by going hunting uh, with Mason Holgate. But Keenan is, is the kind of striker who does want the ball to feet. And of course, he can run the channels and he can put himself about a bit, which he didn't do a lot of tonight, to be perfectly honest. But it was always going to be tough. It was always going to be tough. And that Everton defence is, uh, I think, remarkable is the word. I mean, Michael Keane has had a very good season. Ben Godfrey is fantastic. Uh, he will probably feel a little bit aggrieved if he doesn't go to the Euros, I think, Dan. It, it, it's probably fair to say. Obviously, you've got Mason Holgate who doubled up as the right-back come centre-half, obviously, depending on when, uh, what kind of phase of, of play that Everton were in. Um, it's unfortunate for Keenan. I feel like there's a big difference in being an impact sub and actually starting and, and kind of consistently performing, you know, Keenan's come on in games where, yes, it's been high pressure and, yes, Villa have been chasing games, but he's come on in a situation where Villa are actually creating a lot of chances. He's getting in, in and around the box. Uh, we saw it against West Brom when he got his goal. Uh, and, you know, this isn't me making excuses for him. Of course, I would have liked to have seen Keenan have a larger impact on this game. Um, but, you know, Villa didn't, you know, they created 10 chances um, throughout this game. You know, the XG is reflective of, of Villa not really having too many opportunities to score. I mean, other than late on, Mings had a very good opportunity at the back post. Grealish set him up uh, at the death, could have nicked it. But again, can't be too critical there either. Um, overall, you know, it's just one of them, isn't it, Dan? It's, it's a draw. These results happen. And, uh, you know, we, I think we've got Crystal Palace next. Am I right, Dan, on Sunday? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, again, that's going to be a game where, looking, we've still got Chelsea to play. Um we still have who else do we have, Dan? Chelsea. That's um, just Chelsea and Palace, I believe. No, isn't just it? Oh, well, there we go. That's how quickly it's gone. Um, you know, you're looking, you want to try and get another three points, don't you? Um, so hopefully, you know, on the road. I mean, both sides are safe. Obviously, the relegation spots have all been confirmed. So they're, you know, maybe pressure off for Crystal Palace could see them perform. So, you know, it's always going to be a difficult game, Dan. Um, but I think tonight, just to kind of before we wrap it up, it, it, it's just one of them ones, isn't it, Dan? I feel like, you know, again, I, I, I hate to I hate to have to constantly bring this up where I don't think I've seen any sort of abuse tonight, but don't abuse the players. Like, it's, it's just one of them games, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, mate. And, you know, when you look at the points, Tally is now sat very respectedly at 49 points, uh, which is our best return in the Premier League in 11 years. Um, in 2010-11, we amassed uh, 48. And, you know, we've still got a few games to play. And so... Um, I think there's plenty of stuff to to look forward to. You know, McGinn being back at his best. That point style is looking good. Emmy got that clean sheet. It's, you know, a better performance than than we've seen in recent weeks. And I think you have to give the players credit because 
Everton have a lot to play for. Like that game meant a lot more to them than us. And I felt like we matched them for intensity and for effort. And when you're sort of having to do that consciously, you know, like in most games, you sort of subconsciously go the extra mile, you know, put that extra sprint in and, and those sort of things, which can swing a game when it's so tight as, as it was today. Matching a side who are, you know, desperately needing, you know, I, I always before a game, the, one of the things I always do is just sort of bang the, you know, the, the opposition's hashtag in on Twitter. Just see what the fans are saying. It sort of gives you like, just get their side on things because, you know, they know more about the opposition than anyone. And one, I saw a few Everton fans, there was this tweet, which was getting loads of retweet and loads of like calling it their biggest game of the season because of what it meant in their European title challenge. You know, getting one back over on us, their away form as well. They now sit, you know, they were in eighth. They could have gone as high as sixth if they won today. And I don't feel like it necessarily felt like we didn't have anything to play for. I felt like we matched them in that regard. And I, I think that actually is quite commendable. Um, and so I think that's definitely something you can take away from today is, is seeing the Villa players rise to the occasion like that. Absolutely, mate. And, you know, listen, again, it's, it's a game Villa didn't lose. It's a game where we kept a clean sheet. It's a game where we've seen the return of our captain and it's a game where we're seeing the better of some of our players. And I think that's a good note to end this on, Dan, really. Uh, it will be a quick turnaround with a preview. I'll hopefully get that out tomorrow after work. Um, and hopefully, you know, again, it's a, it's a short turnaround with the podcast. I don't expect many of you guys to listen to this, but to everyone that has, uh, I'd just like to give you a massive thank you in advance. And if you haven't already, please subscribe because there's about 55% of you guys who watch these podcasts that aren't subscribed. So, I mean, do it. Why not? Let's see how many subscribers we can get before the end of the season. We're so close to 4.1K actually, Dan. I believe we're about 20 subscribers mm -hmm. off. So if even a fraction of the people that aren't subscribed, subscribe, you've watched this video, then we'll be well on our way to hitting our targets before the summer. So yeah, if you enjoyed the podcast, hit the like button, comment your thoughts below on your man, the match. As always, we're really intrigued to know, even if we don't always get to reply, we always read through your comments. It truly means the most. Uh, and subscribe if you're not already. Up the villa. <laughs>